Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be invited to be a part of this very important, provocative conversation. Since our earliest ancestors looked up in wonder at the night sky and wondered, how does this universe work? What is our place in it? And are we alone? These most profound and fundamental human questions have really been the impetus for humanity's journey of exploration and discovery. The amazing thing is that we happen to live in a time and place of all the generations that lived on this, have lived on this planet where we now have the tools and the technology, the knowledge to begin to answer these questions. NASA itself and our international partners in space exploration are in fact motivated by these very same fundamental questions. And what I'd like to do today for the next few minutes is just give you a snapshot of where we've been for the last 50 some years, the first half century of space exploration, and where we're headed in the future and what that means in terms of technology for space exploration and how that impacts our lives on the Earth and where we see that future developing. So before I get into all that, let me just kind of set the stage about what NASA and our international partners in space exploration really do. We really explore everything from the surface of the Earth to the extent of the observable universe, 10 to the 24 kilometers or about 14 billion light years in terms of temporal coordinates. We do that with a suite of capabilities that include human exploration, vehicles, robotic precursors, and our great observatories in space. And you can think of that as kind of waves of exploration as the technology allows us to push further. We have big vehicles that can operate in the atmosphere in the near Earth region, carrying humans. We have robotic precursors that have now gone on to every planet in our solar system. And then at the extremes of the universe, we use the observatories where we wait for the photons to come to us, which then give us a view into the very distant past and the beginning of the universe. We have two fundamental goals in doing that. One is to expand the boundaries of human knowledge and science. And the second goal, which is equally important, is to ensure that the technology that we develop to make that possible has immediate impact and return on the Earth in terms of economic opportunity, as well as the quality of life for everyone on Earth. So let me talk about where we've been in the first half century, about 58 years actually, more than half a century. In that time, we have landed the first humans on the moon. We have in fact flown 135 successful missions of the space shuttle. And we've built the International Space Station with our colleagues from 15 partners around the globe. <coughs> that, that unique facility is humanity's home away from, from home an orbiting laboratory living and working in space where thousands of experiments have been conducted so far. We have a crew of six people living continuously for the last 16 years. Crews have been uh, exchanged on that at, and have been continuously inhabited. The experiments that have come out of that range from everything from biology, pharmacology, combustion, material science, and on and on and on. Many of those experiments are aimed at developing the technologies that we need to enable humans to travel deeper into space, both in terms of the mechanical systems, as well as the human system, how it can survive in a microgravity radiation environment for, for years at a time. The, the great thing is that most of the experiments that we've conducted have in fact had immediate application to medicine on Earth, remote medicine, um, micro devices that can be used for, for diagnostics, um, a host of technologies and materials and propulsion and others, solar, uh, solar cells, solar energy, and in addition to that, we have now a significant portion of the work being done on the International Space Station. It's actually being done by private sector companies. So that laboratory is available for private sector companies to conduct experiments that can be only conducted in a microgravity environment. And we've had tremendous success with the work being done there so far. If there's one thing that I, that I think is maybe even more profound than what we're learning as we go deeper into space, we're learning about the universe around us, but we're learning just about ourselves. So these two images, the one on the left is actually the, the uh, moonrise over the limb of the Earth that was taken by Jim Lovell and the crew of the Apollo 8 on the first orbit around the moon. As they went around the backside of the moon, they lost uh, calm with the, with the ground control in Houston. Um, there was great uncertainty about what would happen when they would emerge. And finally, they emerged after a few minutes behind the moon, um, gloriously made contact. But as they were doing their mission, this unscripted event happened. They looked out the window and they saw this, and Jim snapped this picture quite um, unplanned. It is the first time that humanity saw the Earth as it truly is, this blue, delicate marble suspended in the blackness of space, the only place that we know that has the right conditions to sustain life as we know it. 
And, I, and many will credit this, this particular image with kind of uh, kicking off our awareness about um, the environment and our responsibility to it. The, the picture on the right is another that was um, taken by a different explorer, our Curiosity rover that's on the surface of Mars, a robotic autonomous avatar that we have now on the surface of Mars. Every day that uh, robot goes through its uh, planned activities autonomously. At night it takes a series of images, relays those back to Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and the crew plan the activities for the next day and, and upload the, the commands. This image came back to us quite unexpectedly of the night sky as the sun was setting in Mars. And what you see there over the horizon are two tiny dots that we had to blow up that you might just be able to see in the night sky. Those are the Earth and its moon, which are at that distance indistinguishable from any other point of light in the sky. And again, that really profoundly, I think, changes the way we see our role in this universe. As I mentioned, all the technologies that we needed to develop, many of them didn't exist before. Miniaturized computers for Apollo, um, as I said, miniaturized uh, diagnostic equipment, host of um, thermal imaging technologies that we need for space, all the COM, all the GPS, all the things we come to know in our everyday lives were developed because they didn't exist and they were needed for this most extreme and demanding scientific endeavor. And all of them have been incorporated in our everyday lives. So this is sort of the return, the benefit that we get from the investment that our countries make in space. My colleague John will talk a lot more about this in the upcoming session. So um, let me, let me move now and talk about where we're headed from here. So it's been a remarkable first century, half century. I think the question that I, what I, what I'd like to explore now is, so what does the next half century look like? And I can assure you it is even more fantastic, more amazing, and beyond our imagination than the previous half century. We have a couple things that are happening that are going to change the picture of space exploration. A couple big changes in the world. One of them is sort of in the, in the, in the, uh, the industrial base and the economic model. Um, the business model that we use to explore space. Uh, just, I think there's been a lot of conversation, as you've seen in the press and otherwise, about the emerging private sector space companies. This is something that promises to change dramatically the, the cost and the capabilities available to go into space. Now, I should just tell you that that is an expected outcome. As I said at the very beginning, the government sees, and NASA in particular, two roles. One, that we push the boundaries of exploration, and two, that we ensure foster and incubate those capabilities and commercial opportunities that accrue as a result of that. If you think of aviation in the last century, NASA's predecessor, NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, was formed to promote aviation, to provide the technology and impetus for an aviation industry. Great, in, great government investments were made in wind tunnels and facilities and capabilities, which were then passed on to the private sector. Um, and in fact, the government ceded that industry with airmail in this country, in the United States, and around the world. Government ceded that industry before there was a business case, sort of give them a kick start. As we know, that aviation industry we all rely on today now globally is a multi-trillion dollar industry, far exceeding the government investment. That is the future that we see for space, where the government in and, uh, and military um, investments will be far dwarfed by the economic private sector opportunity in space. And I think we're well poised for that because of the work that you see going on right now with the emerging space um, entrepreneurial companies and, frankly, the technology that we're developing that's going to enable that to be successful. And again, the government is in the role of investing in those technologies that are not commercially viable, but then making those available to the commercial sector to enable their success. So specifically, while, this, while we have invested in uh, companies like SpaceX, like Orbital ATK at NASA, to provide transportation. In the last several years, our, our transportation of cargo to the International Space Station, both up mass and down mass returning experiments, has been contracted with these private sector space companies. And it's provided a business model for them, those nascent companies, to build a business case on. We expand on that as we go forward. At the same time, the government, again, is focusing our investments on those long-term capabilities for deep space exploration for which there's no business case right now. Specifically, we're building a next generation of spacecraft, the Orion spacecraft, the space launch system, uh, launch system that uh, is going to propel that into deep space that will see humans return to the moon, Mars, and on in the solar system in the next decades. And that vehicle is well underway. We've had a test flight last year. We expect to see the first human launches in the next couple years. And uh, we're very encouraged by the progress we're making there. And um, that promises to give us the capability to be able to, again, create uh, a, an economic, um, viable 
concerns in cislunar space and then in Mars. We would expect that the government will rely primarily on government resources for those cases that are, that are not, again, economically viable. But as the commercial space entrepreneurs mature, that we would have, we make our, those, those capabilities would be available for the government to draw on. I would like to paint a picture of very much what we saw in aviation in the last century occurring in the next 50 years in space, where we can imagine um, viable, self-sustaining outposts on the moon, of which the government role may be a small fraction of the net economic activity that's going on that enables the government to take advantage of, um, or, or exploration concerns in general, take advantage of a, an outpost that may be a refurbishment point, a, a port, if you will, on the way to Mars, on the way into the solar system. And I would expect that to grow on its own to become a self-sustaining um, economic <coughs> activity. I would expect that we would see in space exactly what we've seen in aviation, that within the next few decades, certainly within 50 years, we'll see a multi-trillion dollar economic activity, self-sustaining commercial activity in, cis in cislunar space. So finally, I'll, let me come back to the point of the technologies that we need. So we're not just in the business of um, financially uh, incentivizing these, the growth of these capabilities. We are also in the business at NASA particularly of developing the technologies that don't exist, that will enable us to do that deep space exploration. So I, we could talk a lot about this. We could talk for more time than we have. But I'll touch on a few examples. Um, the slide uh, that you see here on the upper left it refers to nanotechnology. These are kind of four of the big hitters, the big levers that we have. Nanotechnology promises to give us new material qualities that have many orders of magnitude in, in strength and, and material properties than we have today, lower the, the mass and, and cost of, of building systems for space, but again, have really application across all fields in, in engineering and technology on the Earth as well. On the right is a graphic about uh, deep space propulsion systems. We're looking at advanced propulsion systems. Obviously, that is one of the most challenging aspects is getting um, out of the gravity well of the Earth and then into deep space for propulsion. We're looking at a host of propulsion systems, a lot of emphasis on electric propulsion, which requires us to develop not just the, the, the hull thrusters, the ion thrusters themselves, but the solar systems that collect the energy. And uh, we are advancing the, the efficiency size, mass efficiency of solar panels. Again, a technology that transfers directly to clean energy on Earth. On the lower left is um, a, a kind of imaginary picture of, uh, of something that I think is very exciting. One of the things that we look at very much, again, is the, is the ability to keep the crews healthy in, an, in, in a really a very foreign, very demanding environment. And we're looking deeply into synthetic biology for a host of reasons, a host of applications that promise therapies for um, you know, some of the mitigations for some of the extreme conditions we see in space flight. But synthetic biology has a remarkable application beyond that. We can imagine developing um, artificial DNA that can be programmed to, to grow a host of, uh, or, or a host of um, capabilities. For example, if you think about a volcanic island rising up in the, in the Pacific out of, if you come back in about a decade, what you see is this forested island. And nature doesn't actually send a bunch of carbon and a bunch of cellulose to make that. It actually sends that information on a seed that has the, 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 the instructions to grow from all the in-situ materials, everything that you need to make that forest. Similarly, on Mars, we've got sunshine, we've got soil, we've got water. With the right uh, artificial biology, we can, in fact, grow a lot of the things that we need, both fuel, oxygen, the capabilities we need, as well as structures, potentially. Again, something that has that and... Um, in fact, uh, additive manufacture, remarkable potential. Finally, this probably is the most um, amazing and transformative technology, this idea of strong artificial intelligence. We're developing that because as we move further away from this planet, you, you know, everything you see on a movie about how space operations work, you'll notice that they're on the, on the comm talking to the hundreds of smart guys in Houston, right? Whether it's the, the physicians and the, and the flight doctors, or it's the mission control engineers to solve problems real time. At Mars, that light time is up to 40 minutes. So you're not actually going to solve problems real time with a lot of offboard intelligence. All that intelligence needs to be eventually on board, on the surface, in the spacecraft with the team. So we are quite serious about pursuing um, uh, techniques for doing that, partnering with the, the great work that's going on out in industry in this, in this arena. And I'd only tell people in this audience that that is it, we, we could, again, talk for hours about that. That is easily the most transformative thing that's going to affect not just spaceflight, but every aspect of society, and I would say our culture and our relationship. 
So I will um, close by saying I predict we'll have, again, in the next 50 years of space exploration, we will see a multi-trillion dollar uh, cislunar economy, which offers a tremendous opportunity for a host of, uh, of emerging and not even thought of space companies. And we'll see benefit for everybody on Earth. We'll also see, for the young people that may be listening to this, the generation that's coming up now that will be inspired by this, as I was inspired as a child by the Apollo mission, will be the first generation to know humanity as a multiplanetary species. They'll be the first generation to live and work among intelligent machines. And with a little luck, they'll be the first generation that will um, have definitive evidence of life on other worlds. Thank you very much for your time.